Hello and welcome to Breaking Ground on iProperty Radio with myself, Carol Tallon, the show where we chat to industry experts to get a view on what's happening on the ground and to learn about new trends emerging within the construction industry. The show is brought to you in partnership with Place Engage, a data-driven platform for more successful public consultation and community engagement for your next development project. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Susan Cormican, Group Director of Ethos Engineering. Susan, you're very welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Carol. Great, a great day to be uh, to be interviewed because it's uh, Women in Construction Day, and it's fantastic to see the day celebrated. Do you know? And and I love this, Susan, because this is genuinely a coincidence. We get to have this conversation on International Women's Day, and in fact, uh, more than that being a coincidence, you were the 2023. Uh, Woman in Construction Award at the National Construction Awards just last November. So first of all, congratulations on your award. Uh, you're an extremely worthy winner. And we're going to to I'm, I'm looking forward to having a chat about your experiences in the industry. So you're right. While it is a coincidence, it's wonderful timing that we're chatting here today on International Women's Day. So happy International Women's Day to you. Thank you very much. Right back at you. As as a woman in construction. International Women's Day, tokenistic or necessary? Absolutely necessary. Uh, I've been 32 years in the industry and I have been in those 32 years trying to find ways to increase the proportion of, uh, of women in, in construction and engineering, working with Engineers Ireland and STEM, working with SIBSI, uh, working with CIF. And we've just hit... A, uh, a sort of a plateau where it's not improving and even uh, UK organisations it's plateaued there so every single thing that we can do to highlight what a fantastic career engineering is and construction is we need to do. How long are you in the industry Susan? I graduated in 92 so about uh, 32 years at this point yeah. Have things improved over that time? In some ways, they have. Um, uh, in lots of ways, they have. We now have um, women's toilets on building sites, which is a recent development, which is great. <laughs> um, and uh, lots of things. I, I have to say, uh, in all of my 32 years, I've never found colleagues in engineering an issue. I think I've probably found probably um, maybe the sort of site-based activities where guys wouldn't be used to seeing women as much back in the day. That was, um, you know, dead rats on your desk and that kind of thing. But that's all gone now, thank God. Um, so it's it's improved an awful lot. And I think a company like Ethos, where when I joined in 2016 and there were, I think there was only one female engineer and they've absolutely embraced um, the increase in women that, that has followed by having a woman in management and that's grown a lot and, and the guide have been great and even we've been interviewing on LinkedIn some of our younger female engineers and they've said they've been made feel so welcome and so included there's no difference now to somebody to a young girl coming into engineering there's absolutely no difference between male and female which is great um, and look, I, I'm delighted to hear that. It's the way it should be. But actually, I, I, I do have to ask one side question there because you brought it up. Uh, you know, you mentioned there are now women's toilets on site. Um, I, I, I engage quite a lot with the Boldest Brass campaign in the UK. Catherine Evans, she's a pure inspiration. And in fact, one of her uh, one of her bugbears is uh, women's toilets on site being kept locked and having to go find a key and access them. So is that an issue you've come across? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and it is embarrassing. <laughs> um, I suppose the argument is, would you rather them filthy or rather them locked? I don't know the answer to that either, and they shouldn't be filthy, but it just to have them there is, it's a relatively recent development, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, and I couldn't put an exact date on it, but um, I'd say 10 years ago, it, it, there wouldn't have been. Um, certainly not on every site, and every site differs. So, it obviously is. It is embarrassing to go and have an ask for a key. Yeah, but at least at least they're there. So, uh, well, do you know what? Um, actually, two two points on that. First of all, to anybody that has a building site, uh, with women's toilets that are kept locked, and I understand the reason for it. Please understand that there's technology here, like uh, access control and other great uh, technology that would allow women to have a digital key on their phone, scan, and you would have access into the toilet. So actually, that's a really solvable problem through technology. So yeah. actually, as a really, uh, let's just solve that problem, doesn't need to be there. On the second point, 
And I'm not asking this as a criticism because I've asked it of myself actually only in recent uh, in recent months. But um, are we setting the bar very low for the construction industry when we celebrate that after, you know, that you were more than two decades uh, into your career and we're celebrating that in the in your third decade, uh, there were women's toilets on site. Are we setting the bar very low for the construction industry? Yeah, well, it's 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 a low bar, I suppose. I suppose I was answering more answering the question about how things change in thirty years than they have, but it is, it is a low bar, absolutely. Yeah, there's no question, and I I think it's not, it's it's not due to. I suppose it's kind of two ways. There aren't there haven't been enough women to push, and when you're on site. You don't want to make a big deal about you're under pressure enough because you're climbing ladders and you're, you know, you're finding your way around. And it's it's a kind of a it's it's a very male, uh, it's a very, very male environment. You don't necessarily want to be raising other issues. And I know that sounds very defeatist, but uh, I think I think we finally got there now. So so let's keep pushing. Uh, but I don't think we need to beat ourselves up too much about how long it took. Yeah, I know. And that's a, that's a really fair point. And actually, one of the things let's let's take a positive of this. You know, I mentioned them, that you were the winner of the the Women in Construction Award last year at the National Construction Awards. And a really uh, something really positive came from that. And that was um, there were uh, I, I think there was something like um, were there 10 finalists in that category, all of superb caliber like really high uh, with some of our uh, some of the largest companies across the built environment but also some really small ones which was interesting to see but we were seeing uh, the the range of female leaders coming up through the ranks is very strong and that's really heartening to see to the to the extent where actually for 2024 we're going to have the inaugural women in construction awards um and I've talked about I just mentioned this as being a positive step forward. But um, Susan, I, I don't mind saying to you that I struggled with this. You know, when the organizers of the awards proposed this, I struggled a little bit. I, 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 I had to ask myself the question, if we launch a Women in Construction Awards in Ireland, is that good for showcasing what we know is immense talent and talent coming up through the ranks in construction? Or is it almost admitting defeat that we don't believe these women are going to be featured in the National Construction Awards? Um, and, and that was my thought process. We've come to the conclusion that it's a positive thing, but it's something that I wish wasn't necessary. What's what's your take on this? I Yeah, I suppose it doesn't. It doesn't seem like it should be necessary, but I think that's a very immediate thought. And then I immediately flip to but we do need it so badly. We 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 have stagnated in the uptake of uh, women in in an engineer in engineering and construction careers. I've tried lots of other things, and there's some things that are working and some things that aren't. We can go through those in a while if you want. But one thing that's glaringly obvious is we're just not visible. We're just not visible to um, enough people in the industry and we're not visible to people outside the industry. So when Mary's sitting at home having her dinner with her brother Johnny and the parents, nobody's saying, God, my God, you know, I saw I saw in the paper today uh, awards for people, for women in engineering who didn't even know you could have women in construction. And what about a career there? And that's, we need to get out beyond construction. And this is the only way to do it. So if you can't see, you can't be. It's worked for ladies football, for example. It's worked for uh, soccer in the UK. You know, they've taken off because it's now visible. And I think for that reason alone, we need to sell this as a, it's showcasing what a fabulous career engineering and construction is. And that's the sole point of it. And if we, in you might find in two years time, you know, we've loads more uptake and or it's five years time or whenever, and we don't need these awards. But I think, we need them now for this specific reason. And I would like to think that the vast majority of women in the room will have a really, really good, uh, a really good event and a really good night. And that there'll be very few that will be saying, uh, feeling, feeling bad about it because we shouldn't have to have it. It, it just it, it is necessary in my view. Um, so I, I think that that's a really good uh, approach to take with this and actually one of the things that then I'd love to add to that is that yes we hope those 
women in the room who are shortlisted and recognized serve as an inspiration to the other women across the industry who, again, might be just coming up through the ranks. And, um, you know, there's it, it can be difficult sometimes to be recognized within an industry. So it is important to do it. But actually, the most important thing on the night of those awards, I want to see that all of the business owners, male or female, the decision makers, the project owners, they're the people I want to see in the room. So they're looking and I don't care whether they're male or female and I don't care which brand they carry. But I want to make sure that they're in the room and that they are looking to the stage and they're recognizing this wealth of female talent at all stages of their career. And actually, with that, with that in mind, I probably should say well done to Business River for actually taking the initiative to run the Women in Construction Awards. Um, and I'm so delighted that iProperty Radio is uh, the, the radio partner of this awards. Again, you know, it, it, it you, you pointed out, Susan, why it is important for the industry. So let me do the call out to the industry and say the awards are now open. The Women in Construction Awards are now open for uh, application. I think they're open for about another week and all the application details can be found at Women in Construction. That's WIC awards.ie and actually the range of categories is great so yes we've got the excellence in senior leadership and we've got overall winners but we also have categories broken down for engineering for design and architecture for consulting for um diversity and inclusion champion and i think that's a really important one but one of the things i'm really excited about is for the best female-led team i can't wait to see what kind of entries go in for there um and, you know, I, I, I've kind of touched on it there, but these categories, I think, focus on what's important, and that is excellence in the projects. So with that in mind, Susan, I'm delighted that we were able to have a conversation on International Women's Day. And again, that genuinely was coincidental, um, because from my perspective, uh, you're a woman in construction, that's great. But actually, my interest in construction is always around the projects. Um, and when you won the Women in Construction Awards, what really stood out to me was actually the scale of projects that you focused on during your career and the variety of projects. And I think for me, that's what will inspire the next generation of talent. You touched on a very important point. It's not just about, yes, we need to attract more women into the industry, but actually we need to attract more everybody into the industry. Um, the CIF and Skillnet and a government have done so much in terms of resourcing, uh, understanding and recognising the skills gap. And I think one of the things that came through very clearly in a report last year is that um, career guidance teachers aren't encouraging people into a, into a career in construction and they maybe don't understand what a career in contemporary construction looks like. You know, that, yes, there's muddy boots on the ground, but actually there's a whole host of other, whether you're looking to um, off-site and modern methods of construction, whether you're looking kind of at the back end operational on site or back end and the commercial side, whether you're in, um, involved in the project comms, there isn't a clear understanding about all the different roles of construction. And if career guidance teachers can't say that to their students, if parents don't understand this or if parents still have a very negative attitude, which would be understandable after the past decade and a half coming out of the crash, there would be a fear about encouraging your child into construction when we've had such deep cycles. What can we do going forward? How can we how can we showcase the amazing projects and use them as a source of inspiration? I think what you're yeah, what you're saying is is correct. Um, uh, Carl, we did after the CIF uh, conference last year and there was uh, such a buzz in the room after that um, I went away and set up a cross party um, collaboration with uh, Association of Consulting Engineers, um, SIBSI who are the Chartered Institute of Building Services Engineers and CIF and uh, Engineers Ireland were involved as well and we sat down and we said okay what what it, what are the blockers what are the barriers here and you've mentioned a few of them um, lack of choice at all girls schools is is a big issue. So I've had TY students coming to me saying we don't have we don't have the subjects, but I'd love to give it a try. And they come in here and we just 
specific curriculum for them for the week. And and I've mentored quite a few uh, girls coming in here uh, for TY experience and they've gone away and gone on to do engineering. But if they hadn't done that, they wouldn't have that access. And they don't have the subjects in the schools because they don't have the budget and they don't have the teachers. And um, even when I was in school, physics was 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 rare. Now it's still prevalent, but they're not getting construction studies. They're not getting woodwork. They're not getting metalwork. They're not getting engineering, um, drawing. Um, you're right about career guidance counsellors. They're not educated to push engineering equally across genders. Parents don't push their daughters. The amount of 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 school. Um, uh, sort of days that they have to 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 uh, STEM related um, events, where girls have come up to me and teachers have come up to me and said, um, "Oh, I want to be, you know, I want to do hairdressing or I want to be a nurse." And I've said, "Have you thought of engineering?" And and they've said, "No." Well, my brother's doing that, but you know, my parents wouldn't wouldn't see that. So so parents aren't pushing their kids to do maths and physics, uh, and then kids don't see it as glamorous. Boys and girls just don't see, you know, we've got the likes of all these dramas on TV like Suits and House and they're profiling legal and medical careers as being really glamorous. We don't have that and we don't have anything like it apart from German Bannon and fairness to him. <laughs> but, you know, there's nothing yeah. there's nothing out there saying this is a glamorous career. This is fabulous. Um, and and that's why. Yeah. Sorry, while it doesn't compare to House or Suits, TG Cahar are actually at the moment uh, filming a series following contractors okay. um, and I'm really looking forward to that airing because to be honest it's not a glamorous industry and I think when we showcase it more through the TG Car series I think we're going to show that it's not a glamorous industry but by god it's a good one in terms of challenging it's it's interesting and you know in a way what could possibly be more fulfilling than actually seeing something come to life something that was uh, designed something that was planned that was designed that was engineered and then delivered on the ground that that uh, multidisciplinary approach I think it is the ultimate in creation where you have to bring so many different skill sets together to be able to bring something to life and then that something shapes the skyline of a town or a city or provides employment you know it's it's just from that point of view the fulfillment across the industry so yes it's absolutely challenging um, but challenging in an amazing way that you get to be part of something great. And then for for generations, you can then point and know that you were involved in that. You were just one of the multidisciplinary team involved in delivering something great. Like, can you remember why do you know? Like, was there a point in time when you made a decision where you became aware of construction or maybe was construction even on your radar when you thought about engineering as a career option? No, not in the least. No, I kind of fell into it. Um, Carol, to be perfectly honest, I uh, did physics in school eventually when we persuaded the um, uh, the the staff that physics would be great. We had enough people. I did science in the local RTC. And by pure chance, uh, a university from the UK were over talking about uh, a mining college of all things and how the mining industry was going to boom in Ireland. And I went off and did three years over in a mining college which I loved, it was great, blowing things up and then driving diggers and everything, the practical side of it was fantastic. And then I came back to find that there wasn't this wonderful career here. Uh, and I, I got a job, luckily, um, through mining industry with an electrical engineer. And I spent my first seven years from being a graduate doing electrical systems for um, power stations and then hospitals, bizarrely, and then started doing the mechanical engineering. So I've literally walk, slept, walked into it really, uh, and then found that it was, uh, you know, in the early 90s, there wasn't very many jobs. And this was something that was, you know, they were looking for people. It, there was lots of opportunity. And I just stayed in there and developed. And, and it still is an amazing sector for opportunity and development. And we are screaming out for engineers in both the trades and the consulting services sector, and we just can't get enough people in. So that that's the main thing for me is that it, it just there's so many opportunities, so much variety. You can migrate between engineering disciplines so easily, and you get to travel the world, and it, it just it's a fantastic career. 
Um, Susan, I love that your face lit up when you remembered blowing things up and driving diggers. Um, you know, so I, I, I like to me, that's what serves as an inspiration. When you look back over your career at any point, what are the project? What are the projects that stand out to you? Um, probably the Cork School of Music. Um, it was a very difficult project, but it is amazing. Uh, and and that was back in the um, 2000s. I think it was 2004, as Fanny handed over. Ballymun Regeneration, uh, again, in, in the 2000s again. So that was regenerating the whole of Ballymun and putting in different renewable and sustainable technologies and working across an awful lot of architects and types of, of developments. And I think it's only... When you finish and come out the other end, you realise how significant projects like that are. Um, of late, um, the National Rehabilitation Hospital in Dunleary, which is, again, it was a challenging project. Uh, lots of different stakeholders, but it's an amazing building. And the two satellite units for the new children's hospital, and I know the children's hospital has had a lot of bad press, but the satellite units in Connolly and, and in Tala, if you walk into those and see the, ki the kids and, and the parents of the kids saying what a fantastic facility both of these are and, and their urgent care facilities for kids uh, that again were painful and it is quite a stressful uh, uh, environment to get all everything working together and everybody coordinated and all of that but when you, when you hear the, the testimony from uh, a member of staff or a parent of a child um, or indeed somebody I know who was in the rehab hospital and saying how great it was they were a patient that makes it all worthwhile for me that, that's the that's the rewarding bit and um, now that you you are a group director within ethos engineering uh, just I suppose so we understand how um, the shape of a career in construction can change over time as you progress you know it's one of those things uh, through any business, uh, uh, whether construction or otherwise, that as you progress, that sometimes there can be a tendency for the right people to be promoted out of roles that they chose and loved and into more leadership positions. And not everybody wants that. Not everybody's comfortable with that. How has that been through your transition? Um, it's been it's been something I've I've been pushing for. And I suppose uh, I was uh, probably in a management role quite early. So I was in a management role with the company back in probably as early as 2006. Um, I got knocked back for promotion there despite being put forward for it. But I went to maternity leave and I suspect, uh, well, I know that that was a factor in not getting that promotion. And that knocked me back a little bit. Went to another company. I was leading two offices, one in Dublin, one in, um, in Limerick. Uh, got on very well there, but they sold out to a, a multinational. So that was unfortunately short lived, took a step back in the recession to move to a larger Irish company. And my career kind of stagnated then for six or seven years. And looking back uh, at that to figure out why it, probably the recession didn't help. But there were no women at senior leadership roles in that company at all. Uh, so there was nobody mentoring you, nobody to... You know, there's an unconscious bias, definitely, in in, in companies, and 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 men don't mean it, but there is. So that particular company I'm talking about, when when I was working there, I got on the recruitment panel, and all of a sudden, the women engineering went from zero or one, which was me, up to five or six fairly quickly within a couple of years. Um, moved on from there to Ethos, where I am now. And again, I was the one, you know, woman technical role when I joined and I now work to about 17, 18, approaching 20 percent, which is above the average in construction. It just it's something I've always wanted to do, but it's something that I feel if there's no women in senior roles, it's very you have to pull people through. There's no point saying, oh, they're going to do it themselves. It's just so difficult. You just have to pull people and get to that unconscious bias by having women in senior positions. Um, a few of the things that have helped along the way is um, the gender pay gap reporting has helped uh, ESG, our clients are now demanding more gender balance. So we're being interviewed by huge multinational companies and they're saying, you know, we want to see a gender balance at technical and at management level, which is brilliant. I mean, that's that's fantastic to see that happening. Peer-to-peer yeah. um, -peer networking like the CIF and Fair Play to the CIF for their women in construction, in their, their events that they have every year. Um, informal mentoring. So, uh, you know, 
the the young engineers that are coming in in here i i normally say to you know if, if they are in any way shy i'd say to them look you need to you know you need to sort of start looking at, at the next step up and you need to you know focus on if there is a promotion why shouldn't you go for it um you know ask for a pay rise don't just assume you're going to get paid just ask yeah. anyway for this get into the habit of doing things that don't come naturally but are are really important um and then on the flip side you know the parental and paternity leave is great because now guys are taking time off so it's not and it's not that they never wanted to take time off. They just never got the opportunity. And now they have the opportunity. So it's much more 50-50. And one analogy I used at the CIF last year conference was I was saying I was quite lucky in that uh, my husband, we sat down and we said, OK, we have to do this when I was pregnant and we had my daughter. We have to do this 50-50. So we made an agreement that in the if anything happened in the morning, so I dropped my daughter to school. And if anything happened up at lunchtime, I dealt with it. But if anything happened in the afternoon, he dealt with it. No matter what happened, the school burned yeah. down, whatever happened, God forbid, it was him that had to deal with it. So it, it, so I wasn't running around like a headless chicken all day trying to deal with stuff. I dealt with it in the morning, he dealt with it in the afternoon. And then I could, you know, I could manage my evenings better with meetings and urgent things. And uh, and it just gives you more of a, a sort of a, a more of a focus on work for at least half of the day when you have kids, because it is stressful trying to balance the two. Um, so, yes. That's, yeah, th that's a brilliant approach. That's really good. Um, I haven't heard that approach, but I think it's really interesting. And, um, you, you know, it's I haven't I haven't heard it broken down like that, but that seems like a really fair and sensible way to do this. I have a question to ask that you might not feel comfortable answering, but I'm going to ask anyway. You know, like you mentioned that obviously now, as I've mentioned, you're group director within Ethos Engineering, which um, is one of the, you know, in terms of reputation would certainly be seen as a leader in the industry is definitely one of the most forward thinking so I, I, I'm conscious that the experience there would automatically be different. But you talked about the firm you were employed with when um, how you were overlooked for promotion when when you went out on maternity leave. And I suppose I'm curious about that uh, to the point where obviously that happened um, a number of years ago. Do you think that's still happening today in less forward thinking firms? I would suspect so. I'd be surprised if it isn't because um, it's, it is, I mean, it, it, let's face it, it is very frustrating when you have somebody in your staff and they have to go and return. It's very frustrating. It's, it's completely natural and understandable that I've been there, but as, an, as, a, as a group manager um, and a group director, you're kind of going, that's great news, but you're in the back of your mind, you, let's be honest, you can't have yeah. thinking, oh, Jesus, what are we going to do now? We have to fill yeah. that. You know, yeah. so that's why the paternity leave is great because now it's equal, and you have guys taking extended paternity leave and parental leave, and it it, it equals, you know, every you know, a lot of people have most people have kids in one way or another. It does equal the board, so so it does. That's the bit that makes the difference, um, and I think it it does. So the, so the women are less singled out as having to take loads of leave because the guys are taking it, and it, it is great. Yeah. And but are the guys actually taking it? Because I, I, now it's it's more than a year or so since I've seen the latest stats on this. But I know that one of the challenges we had in Ireland was that uh, after introducing leave, people weren't using it, and unless people use it, it doesn't become acceptable to use across the industry. So within your company and and to your knowledge across the industry, are men actually using their paternity leave? Yeah, one hundred percent and beyond. So taking paternity leave and extra paternal leave and everything. And I think part of that is the analogy I used earlier, where 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 women are probably a little bit better at home at, at getting to the fifty fifty. You know, just saying, you know, I have to do this, and and maybe because women are getting paid a bit better as well, they have a bit more clout in saying, well, look, I need to do this yeah. you're going to have to take a bit of leave as well and and that's probably part of it so there's a few things feeding into that but it's definitely the guys are taking the leave here yeah and right. and to the point that as well you know the 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 the, the sick days and the crash is closed or there's a case of something and you can't bring your child in you know i'd say it's 
nearly 50 50 the lads are going look i can't come in today or i can't work today because i'm minding the baby because they're sick and that that's the 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 um the, the non-formal way we're saying oh you make it up again or, or don't worry about it um it's it's not a big deal but because it's shared between women and men it makes the, the level playing field a lot a lot better you know, um, Susan, in, in some ways, I, I struggle to identify with some of this because uh, for for most of when my daughter was young, I was a single parent and I was also self-employed. So I, there was there was no let up on, on any score. So actually, my poor daughter would uh, be bundled into the car, sick with a pillow and quilt when work just had to be done. And it's the joys of being self-employed. You just have to turn up and you know it's so actually in some ways um i think when there's structures in place we have to be very uh careful about using them because actually you touched on something very important there is that you know as when you're uh involved in leading a team and leading a project when you hear about um maternity leave and, and paternal leave coming up um so of course uh, this is a happy occasion and you know what's one to be celebrated but actually there's a reality on the ground the projects still need to be kept going clients are still expect their pro projects to be delivered on time and within budget uh, or sorry within program and you know so there are expectations as well and I think that that is something that if if more men uh, avail of the leave that they are to which they are entitled then actually construction companies uh, wouldn't and project owners would need to be able to structure um, their teams around that. And actually, by doing that, it would make it much better for women for maternity leave that they shouldn't miss out on promotions because actually, you know, this is going to happen male and female. So therefore, there, there's no difference. And I think it's, it's a really important one. Um, and, you know, you touched on the gender pay gap and because it is International Women's Day when we're having this conversation you know, I, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but actually there's a really good uh, bot online that where big brands, global brands uh, wheel out women on International Women's Day. If there's any element of tokenism there, actually, there's a bot that automatically pulls their gender, their, their gender pay reporting. And so actually there is absolutely no point in celebrating the women within your industry um, on International Women's Day if you're not paying them equally. It's such an important thing and it's something that I think needs to be called out. I mean, you've touched on the important work of the CIF in terms of encouraging women in construction, which is fantastic. And I know Conor O'Connell and the team there really lead the charge in that. But one of the points that we've made in recent years is that, you know, it, it's not about uh, offering confidence training to women. We need to actually make sure that women are paid equally because in my experience if you get paid properly it helps build your confidence so you know it's a it, to me you know there sometimes sometimes is a faster route to achieve what we need to achieve and i know this is something you advocate through uh mentoring and peer-to-peer -peer support so how do we rather than sending them to confidence training which i don't believe women need again you know sort out childcare from a state point of view, pay people well from an organizational point of view, pay people, pay people equally and then suddenly see how equal our confidence levels get. And um, how can we how can we ensure that happens at an organizational level through mentoring? I think the first thing to recognize is that I think we spent many years pretending that there's no difference between men and women. I think we have to accept that there is a difference. We're different types of people. We have different priorities. We think different. You know, you might find, uh, you know, some people are are maybe are exactly the same. But I think we are a different gender and and generally and uh, you know we do think differently about things and um, you know men are better at some things and women are better at other things generally uh not being specific here but but i think uh, i suppose i suppose the mentoring thing i think we spent too long sort of pretending that we're all exactly the same we're all robots and clones of each other and i i, I think if what i accepted was that that and i only because i saw it in myself is that i was very reluctant to ask for a pay rise and I just felt that I wasn't, you know, they call it imposter syndrome. I don't know where it came from because I came from a home with a working mother and a working, a working grandmother. My grandmother was a teacher, so there was no reason for it. And I don't, still don't know why it's there. It just is. 
So I, well, it's not there with me now, thank God, but it used to be when I was younger. So I always try and focus on the things that you can only focus on what your, you know, experience you've had yourself. So, you know, another one is if, if, if girls are particularly nervous about going to site, because it is intimidating. And I remember myself. So we've done up a checklist, not just for the girls, but for everyone. If it's your first time on site, simple things, where do you park, where are the toilets, where's your contact number for the person you're meeting, are you going to be there all day? There all day? Do you need lunch? Simple stuff that yeah. I remember back to when I was a, a young engineer. I just everybody expects you to know everything. Um, and then the other one is, yeah, it's it's. it's um, I suppose if there's, you know, girls to be looking ahead to the next level, don't just don't just focus on what you're trying to do today because what you don't realise is that the guys sitting next year are looking at the next level and the level beyond. And and I I don't know why. This is different, but I've just observed that it is at the fact, yeah. uh, and and we just act differently, and I'd love to know why, but I don't. <laughs> so it's just it's just knowing that, and then being able to identify and being able to target the bits that that we need to push people along with, and and then we'll all get there. We'll get there quicker. Um, Susan, I think she she's your a breath of fresh air. I think that is such a strong point and I've actually never heard anybody articulate it but you're right we need to stop pretending that everybody's the same now I have to say I don't believe that comes down to gender line gender as in male or female I genuinely think it comes down to personality types so um, I actually think irrespective of why people are different it's actually learning how to not just respect those differences but leverage them because you're right there's different skill sets but one of the things that I've really learned through um working with startups over the last 15 years is that, you know, you talk about uh, men and women being different. I actually think that's more on personality lines than gender lines. But there's one thing I've learned very clearly that does tend to happen. And that is that um, men grow through failure, but women shrink through failure. And it's something that's been really well established in academic literature. And it's been borne out by industry stats as well. And actually, so it's almost like looking at the underlying reason. How does failure help propel men forward and how does it make women shrimp, shrink back into themselves um, we don't know why it happens but it's very clear that it does happen and I think maybe uh, being put in a position where you have to ask for things that you're not always going to get so a little bit like you know you had mentioned to me before we came before we started recording you know you mentioned to me how part of, through your mentoring you encourage women to ask for a pay rise at least every year, that they might not get it every year, but at least ask every year. And the reason they need to be asking every year is because the men are asking twice a year. Yeah, twice. correct. So, I mean, but but I, I suppose, have you found when you tell people this, does it almost give them permission to do it? And it almost like, uh, is it making people comfortable with hearing no and not taking it or not internalizing that no as a reflection on their performance rather than as this isn't my year, hopefully next year? Uh, I, yeah, it definitely, it, it definitely overcomes the barrier of asking. Mm -hmm. And then it's up to, if you're saying no, or you're saying, uh, you know, and I have had to say no and yes and no, but uh, yes, but not as much as you want. Yeah. It's then, it's then being able to explain that that's not necessarily a reflection on them. That's just a reflection on lots of other things as well. And it's not any behavior that, that they've exhibited. It just is and give very specific reasons as to why and what focus on the what needs to change to get there and, and what are the things to, to, to do better. And I think we're naturally very um, reluctant or very bad at taking constructive criticism. And I've, I've, been, I've been sort of wondering about this for, for a while and somebody gave me a good analogy of back in the Stone Age, if you did something wrong, you probably died because of it. Whereas if you did something right, there was no, there was no learning from it. And maybe that's why, but we seem to take negative feedback or constructive criticism really badly. And it's about learning to take it better. And instead of thinking that's really unfair, is, is change your behavior to act on it because it, it does make us grow. And to take it as a, if somebody bothers to give you feedback, they don't like, particularly don't like giving bad feedback. Nobody does, but you do it for a reason. You do it to make the person a better engineer or a better manager. Um, and, and you should, if you get that feedback, if you're lucky enough to get it, you should act on it. And that means changing behavior in some way. And that's not to say that everyone giving negative feedback is right all the time, but as a general trend, 
you know, there's a nugget in it somewhere. It's the perception, even if it isn't reality. So, yeah. so think about it and don't just dismiss it. Yeah, I, I actually I think that's a fantastic note to close on because, quite frankly, I could do it here and that from time to time myself. It is it is difficult to see feedback as an opportunity, which is which it inevitably is. Um, you know, an opportunity to learn, an opportunity to grow. But quite frankly, I think at all stages of our career, maybe we struggle a little bit with that. So I'm I'm delighted. Um, so I suppose before before I let you go, and I am conscious of your time, and I appreciate you being so generous with your time today um I, I you know just because there's lots of different there's lots of different things we could do or say but for me you know in the spirit of show don't tell um you know rather than trying to t- say why we should encourage or why people should be encouraged into a career in construction can you tell us your kind of key highlight of your career whether it was a project or a moment but just you know you've had such a distinguished career in construction you're now in a position uh in in a senior position that you're able to impact the industry and look back at the impact that you have and you are continuing to inspire not just uh women coming up through the ranks but all construction professionals coming up through the ranks what has been your career highlight totally caught me on the hop here <laughs> i there have been there have been lots there have been projects there have been uh, successful teams there have been you know targets that we've we've met there's been setting up the innovation uh, um process within ethos which has been very challenging but we've got there and there's been a lot of it's been a lot of things and i couldn't put one over the other really unfortunately i suppose um yeah it's probably managing it's probably managing to raise my daughter Daisy in a, a half decent way, along with my husband, who's been fantastic and a total 50-50 partner. She's gone off to college now to do zoology, and she's she's a great example of somebody who's gone out there to be confident. And that's probably the probably the highlight for me. Fantastic. Susan. That's absolutely fantastic. I genuinely I, I I really appreciate having had the opportunity to talk to you today. And like I said, it was a it was a lovely coincidence that this happened to fall on International Women's Day as well. So thank you so much. And so I am going to to use our final call to action here for anybody listening in. Um and, and you think that you have a story to tell, please uh, log on to the Women in Construction Awards. That's WICAwards.ie. Uh, there's a week to go before entries close. And we would encourage, we want to see uh, female talent at all levels of the career. So whether you're just starting out in your early stages, mid-career level, or you have a number of um, projects that you can point to, we're really interested. There's a category there for everybody. So please check that out. Um, And my thanks to Susan Cormack and Group Director of Ethos Engineering for sharing her story today. My thanks as always to Katie Tallon and to the production team at Hear Me Roar Media and of course to our sponsor Place Engage for making these conversations possible. And thank you indeed for tuning in. We'll catch you on the next episode of Breaking Ground. In the, in the meanwhile, please be sure to check out all of the other Irish and international real estate and construction shows here on iPropertyRadio.com. 